right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Renegade Consortium. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about what to do now. We're in the holiday season. We're towards the end of the year, and this is typically when there's a lot of that downtime that we have uh, just in the real estate industry. Anytime between Thanksgiving and New Year, we just have a lot of downtime. There's not a lot of business going on. So what are some of those good practices that we have during that season. I also noticed that it is the Christmas season. I'm the only one who wore a Christmas sweater. Just pointing that out, guys. I just wanted to address that earlier. I have a Christmas tree. Does, does that help? There we go. It's there perfect. Go. That's good. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's start. Let's start with Steven. I mean, in your brokerage, what are some of the things that you coach your your agents to do during this time? I honestly, I just tell the agents they can hibernate, you know, after, after your Turkey on Thanksgiving, take the rest of the year off. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. Nobody sells real estate in December. It's fine. No, I mean, this we, sounds like one of those trick advice columns. Don't <laughs> listen to me <laughs> uh, in that case. I mean, it, it's a struggle. I mean, it really is. Every year we have the same conversations talking about don't take your foot off the gas. Like now's the time to keep pushing. You know, you can enjoy some downtime with your family, but like you've got to keep prospecting. You know, we all know this, that well, we should, that if you stop prospecting, even for a week or two, that is going to affect your business months later. You know, that that pipeline has to be completely refilled all the time. So, you know, if you do nothing else than just normal business practices, then, you know, you're ahead of 90% of the competition. But it's those agents that use the dead space or the, the spare time, like you said, if, if they use it to their advantage and actually do some things that they have been meaning to do, like, oh, I got to get caught up on this, or I've been meaning to prepare for next year or whatever, like, Honestly, you should have already done your business planning, but if you haven't, do your business planning in the next two weeks. Don't wait till January to do business plan. Um, you know, there's there's a ton of holiday related stuff they can do, like Christmas cards or holiday cards. I'm actually doing New Year's cards this year. I want to be slightly different. Mm. So I'm sending out Happy New Year cards to to some folks. Um, you know, not not really a different thing, but it stands out from the standard you know, happy holidays messaging that everybody gets. Um, so that's, that's what I would say is, is to start, I mean, I'm sure you guys have good ideas, so I don't want to like monopolize, but to start, just do your normal business, keep your, keep your habits up through the holidays as much as you can and focus on business planning. Those are the first two things that I would say. I like the new year's cards because and, and just the thing is, just, this is the idea that came to me right now. I mean, if you get a holiday card, it's like, oh, that's so nice. They remembered me. And then you throw it under the stack of the other hundred that you got. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you get a New Year's card, if you're thinking about moving or if you're thinking about real estate, if you get that right in the beginning of the year, who's the first person you're thinking about? It's like, oh, I do need to call my real estate agent. That's a good idea because that might spur them to call you first thing in the year. We can start to get those transactions moving right in, right in January 1 or you know, whenever it gets there. Yeah. <laughs> or you could forget to send your Christmas cards out on time and then they would receive those after the new year. E either way, Stephen, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Top of mind awareness, yeah. stand out. You have to stand out. Exactly. Yeah. Andrew, I mean, if, if, speaking of like prop tech and things that agents need to do, you know, just to be successful in general, there are a lot of prep things. Like one thing that I've always heard is clean up your database. This is a good time to get that clean data, right? So right. to make sure that people have all of those technology tools that are available to them, that they are actually going to work for you. One big thing that you can do is make sure that all of those people that are in your sphere of influence are on an actual sheet. What are some of those other things where you're like, hey, you know what, just to be successful throughout the year, do this thing just that way you're ready for it. Right. Yeah. I mean, to piggyback off of the great uh, insights that Stephen already gave, which I agree with, don't sleep on the holidays. A lot of people will not take advantage of the downtime and then wonder where all their time went when things get busy in the new year. And then they've essentially wasted that opportunity. One thing that I will add, though, that we do is we have a very, uh, you know, custom built out efficient system or database. And it tells us from a few clicks of a button, what we did in the prior year. So when we're planning, we're not only planning our goals around what we want to do 
since we're in 2023 into 2024, but we can go back and say, what did we do the last quarter? What did we do the last year in 2023? What lean sources were working for us? What people or personnel were working for us? And then you use that coupled with your goals for 2024 from hopefully you're getting this information out of your database easily, uh, but you're just making those to help kind of tailor the decisions based on what was working. You don't want to just say, all right, it's two weeks before the next quarter, I'm going to send out a bunch of mailers. You want to know which mailers you sent out last year that actually returned money, uh, you know, capital and an investment um, to your company. So that's the one thing I'll add there is we always historically go back. We do this every month or every quarter in real time anyways. But at the end of the year, it's when you go back and you say, hey, system, give me a snapshot of where all of our business came from. How did we get it? You know, how long did it take to get, how much money did we spend and how much money did it return? So that's the one thing that I'll add. If you don't have a system in place like that, you're still kind of shooting from the hip, but that's how you make sophisticated business decisions, right? Not off of what I would like to do, but what I've done in the past that was working or not working. What kind of system would do something like that? I mean, just to throw that out there. What do you mean? Well, you're saying that we should use the system to to identify what worked. I mean, I mean, I imagine we're not talking about a manual spreadsheet here. So what's something that I can ask that's like, hey, you know, of all the marketing stuff that I sent out, the mailers, the videos, yeah. the CMAs, so, what? And it's like, this one got the biggest engagement. So how do I see that? Yeah, so we use Billions. It's a system that we created. But essentially what we do on the front end is any marketing initiative we have is we uniquely identify that in our system from the get-go. And what I mean by that is if I do, I don't know, a 4th of July mailer, I'll get a unique identifying phone number for that mailer. So that one phone number equals that 4th of July postcard, for example, we'll mail it out. As leads start to come in, the system already knows that when that phone number is called, you know, an inbound call comes in, it tags it as 4th of July mailer, as a direct mail category, and then it's tracking every single piece of data, every KPI, every um, you know money piece of it. And we just do that for every single thing we do. And then we have pre-built out data analytics on the back end of our platform that shows us what happened from that mailer. So we'll do a 4th of July postcard A with my face on it or postcard B with you know, Tom's face on it and people think he's better looking than me. So they call the one with Tom and then it, we're just A, B split it, testing it. Right. So we're getting rid of A, putting a fence around B, but we're getting that information in real time as it happens, not only from the time the leads come in, but like when an appointment is set and who set the appointment, when an agreement is signed and who signed it, when an escrow is happening and how much, uh, you know, top line revenue, how many, how much cost of goods sold and net and uh, bottom line revenue you're getting for that one particular postcard in general, and then in the direct mail category. So if you set up your system in the front end to tell you all this information on the back end, that's how you make these decisions. So we're not manually doing anything other than plugging in, hey, I just got a new postcard and here's the phone number. So I'm, I'm literally going in and I'm going to my call, we use CallRail. We're saying, hey, CallRail, I need to map this new postcard. I put in July postcard A, tag it as direct mail, click map source. And then the next time that number is called, it's it's feeding through our platform the way I just walked you through. Do agents know what KPIs are? I don't know. I, it's just a blanket question. I, I mean, I know because I worked at prop tech companies for a decade, but I, yeah. Yeah, I so they're, they're key performance indicators. And one of the, you know, one of the ones I'll touch on for like what we use in our platform is like, how many, uh, how many appointments do we have to go on to sign a deal, right? To get a new agreement or how many agreements do you need to have to close a deal? Those sort of things. So we also have one around, um, and this kind of goes into like the, the planning for the future quarter or the year, how many interested leads do you have to get to close one deal? So a really easy math example, um, call it 10 interested leads to close one deal. If you want to close a hundred deals in 2024, you reverse engineer the math based off of your numbers from last year of, you know, on average, every 10 interested leads, I close one deal. I want to do a hundred in 2024. 
multiply 10 by 100, you get a thousand interested leads. So that's your goal. So you say, okay, we'll, we'll split it up by quarter, 250 leads a quarter would hopefully, you know, if, if the trend analysis continues, allow us to close a hundred deals next year. But then you can use like in our, we have a marketing analytics dashboard that shows us where all of our leads came from. And then how many leads equal an interested lead. So you kind of just reverse engineer and look at the data. We, we make data decisions. We don't make, oh, I think this did well. Let's do it again. We did before, I'll admit, and it was stressful and really hard. And it was kind of like shooting from the hip. But if you're making really you know informed decisions based off of tangible data, it makes your goal setting and achievement that much more easier, which it did for us. You know, I, I think that's an interesting topic of using that data, especially in the real estate industry. Steven, do you coach your agents to like, look at that day? Like, okay, it's the end of the year. How many transactions, how many leads, where did that come from? You know, that, that sort of thing is important, but I feel like there's a lot of agents to steer away from that. Cause they're like, my business is talking to people. So how, uh, you know, what level of you should be looking at numbers a little bit, not all the time. Not I mean, we're not talking about having a dominate your week, but you know, once a month, go back and look at these numbers how, how do we tell agents to do that we, we i would love them to but most agents i would say 90 percent of them aren't really interested in that kind of analytical look at their business it's unfortunate because i mean that it really should be like you know the way andrew's team does it i mean that's phenomenal um and i've seen i've seen companies that do that for their agents there was a small company i worked with in texas and they would actually track the source of every deal and then they would do a pie chart at the end of the year when they were doing business planning and they're like okay so 75 percent of your business came from your sphere of influence so what are you doing to market to your sphere of influence obviously that's your bucket of business or 40 percent of your business came from relocation are you cool with that because that's a huge referral fee you're paying every time. If you'd want to make more money, you want to make that pie a little bit smaller. Uh, but if you don't know those numbers, you don't, you can't make those data-driven decisions. You know, I've got agents that, you know, they've done two thirds of their business is lead gen. Okay. I mean, that's fine, I guess. But, you know, I, I, I know an agent, one of the top producers in his market, this is in a different state. He doesn't get repeat clientele. People do not want to work with him twice. So he's constantly spending tons of money to market himself. But his client follow-up is terrible post-closing. You know, they're like, I don't want to, I'm not dealing with him again. <laughs> okay, well, but but he's a top producer. So whatever he's doing is working. But if he was able to look at that from an analytic standpoint to go, gee, what could I do differently to actually capture the re repeat and referral business? he would probably make a ton more money at the end of the day because he's not spending it all uh, up front. So I, I think agents should be doing that. I don't think they do. And I think a brokerage should at least have the mechanism available to where they can do it. You know, you don't have to necessarily do it for them, but it would be a big lift for us having so many agents. But if you're a boutique or a team, then you should be able to at least have that data there. Like, are you interested in taking a look at this? No? Okay, well, fine. But stressing the the importance of knowing where you're spending your money, where you're spending your time, and being able to um, to move the needle as as you need to. If that guy watches this podcast, is he going to know you're talking about him right now? <laughs> uh, if if I said his catchphrase, he certainly would. But no, okay. I seriously doubt uh, that he would be able to identify. Because honestly, that's a problem across the country. He is not alone in that. I know a lot of agents who cannot get repeat business because they just they're like a bulldozer they get clients they slam them through a, a transaction and they move on to the next one and that that they're not interested in keeping in touch with them and i just think it's a it's a huge you know waste of marketing dollars i mean you're you're spending so much time and money chasing new clientele when you've got hundreds if not thousands of people that you've worked with over decades that could potentially hand you business for essentially free Oh yeah. There's lots of research on that of like, 
you know, sphere marketing is like one in 12 leads pans out or, or converts. And it's like, you know, it's one in a hundred otherwise. So yeah, it's, it's be great if you could get that follow-up and then, you know, I mean, that's how the tail end of your career is supposed to go really easy, right? You grind in the beginning, but then everybody just keeps coming back to you because you're that person, which by the way, Andrew, I know I was kind of knocking analytics a minute ago. I am actually reading a KPI book called OKRs for all. So I, it's like a OKRs and KPIs. I, I do actually love the analytics portion of this. And I do think think that that is really important. Speaking of which, Michael, so I want to talk a little bit about social media and some of the stuff we, you and I have talked about, about planning. So this is that time where you have a lot of downtime. Is that what, when we talk to agents about, Hey, this is social media is important for brand recognition. I, how do we tell them utilize this time in order to get a lot of that stuff ready for your new year? Yeah. I, um, just to kind of riff off what, um, what the guys were talking about before right now it's stocking the pond top of funnel leads cost per lead is going down because people pull back you see i mean i just got a thing realtor.com 60 percent off of of leads so when people pull back you double down and especially Mm -hmm. since i see all these these news reports about rates dropping below eight percent real estate porn is still being watched um you know regardless of portal so I think the um, I think it's really about putting as many leads in as possible because they're going to buy, they're going to sell in the springtime, but now it's the time to where you're going to be able to capture them for the least amount of money because um, in the new year, everybody's going to start putting their marketing dollars to work and they're going to be competing and spending a ton of money that they could have saved from, from doing some advertising in, um, in December. Also, um, talking about on the sell side, I I read a I read an article on CNBC. Mortgage re- refinance demand jumps nineteen percent. So getting in touch with your lender, um, and Stephen, I you can probably talk to this better. Um, getting in touch with your lender so you can do some planned outreach to homeowners with the fact that people are refining. Um, but also again, I don't want to say piggybacking, but being there as support for that that lender um, when coming in with the fact that now's the time to refi if you want to refi. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think it's just, it's just getting yourself out there, bringing in as much, filling your pipeline as much as possible. um, And then just, just kind of working those leads until they bear fruit in spring. So that's, I, I want to piggyback on what Michael just said. So from a, from a lender standpoint, that's actually a great idea is uh, so HELOCs, for instance, home equity lines of credit, are very popular right now because nobody wants to refinance out of a 3% mortgage into a seven or eight, but they have all this equity tied up so they can just access it with a HELOC. Uh, They're super fast, like five day turnaround, you'll have cash in your hand. And so, you know, as, as the inflation stuff has kind of happened and all this other stuff, you know, we went from the COVID era where everybody was cash heavy, like everybody had cash to burn. Now consumer debt is at an all time high again, People are going to come out of this holiday season cash poor. Uh, you know, it, it, they, they've blown their wad on Christmas. They decide to go all out, whatever. And they're going to, you know, January is going to come around. The credit card bills are going to start coming in. I mean, all the credit cards have jacked their interest rates up to you know, 26, 29% in some case, whatever. And I think if a realtor would partner with a lender to say, hey, let's reach out and and say, like, as a, as a, service to you, my client, I want to make you aware that you have some home equity that you may want to tap into. Am I getting a sale from that client by sending them through HELOC? Not necessarily, but it's an awesome opportunity for me to ask for a referral. I've just solved a big problem that you may not have realized there was a solution for. Who's your best friend right now? I just, I just gave you a way to get 50 grand cash in your hand that you want to do that remodel or you want to pay down some of your debt or whatever. You're welcome. Oh, by the way, if you know anybody that's buying or selling, you know, uh, I've now done you a favor. You can help me too. Uh, so I think, yeah, teaming up with a loan officer on that kind of marketing would be great. Social or even, you know, mailers, direct outreach through phone, whatever. These people know, like, and trust you already. So it should be an easy conversation to have. Yeah. I think you know, when I was these points, you guys, it's, it's go, goes back to that, like, don't sleep on November, December, like slow time, but come January, I think the fed said that they're going to make six decreases in the rates. Right. So what does that mean for the 
real estate market. I think home prices are going to start to get a little bit out of control, but there's going to be crazy bidding wars again. But then the agents who are going to sleep on the last quarter of the year and say, oh, you know, next year I'll do it. They're going to turn around and see agents posting, you know, 30 days in where we've closed 45 transactions and they're going to wonder why. This is why right now. If you plan and you put together, you know, your your pond, Michael, this is how you turn and convert from your efforts today into your transactions tomorrow. And the big, you know, the big agents in your area, the, the successful agents never turn this off, quite frankly. They never stop. And this is how they're compounding their, their deals year after year. They'll go from 100 to 2 to 4. Now, there, it's not surprising to see people posting about 700, 1200 transactions from like a mega team with 20 or 30 people, which is crazy. But this is why. Well, and, and to really, really quick point, and then Tom, you can take it back over. Something to consider if you're watching this and you're thinking about business planning for next year, don't forget it's an election year. So we're going to hit the skids around August and we probably won't come out of it until November. I mean, it, 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 everything's going to slow down. It always does without fail. You know, uh, it, it's going to it's going to kind of everyone slams on the brakes. going. I don't know what's going to happen. For some reason, you know, they think whoever's in the White House is is affecting their daily life and, and their house. I don't know why, but they do. You know, so when you're planning, don't plan as though you're going to have a smooth year the whole year. You've got a front end load 2024. If you're going to make the kind of money you want to make, you really need to make the majority of it in the first six months because you're going to have a dead zone there where not a lot's going to happen. Yeah. Just because of the election cycle. August, September, when you go on listing appointments, you're going to hear, you know, we do want to sell, but we're going to hold off and wait to see what happens in the White House. We have every four years that happens. And it, I don't know, it, it, that happened with uh, Amazon HQ2 coming into our area too. Everyone used that as something to say to either not make a move or whatnot. But yeah, Stephen, I completely agree. You're going to start to see that. So you can probably count on the last bit of the uh, quarter three moving into quarter four, that happening and kind of everyone just a stalemate. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot to take in. I, and I did, you know, getting all your business done in the first six months, that's pretty typical of the industry anyway. If I'm not mistaken, 80% of business, doesn't it get done between March and June anyway? Like that's, that's where like, there's such a hot time throughout the course of the year. So now we're just going to lean into it now. And, well, you know, to, there was this oh. expression that I heard in college. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you, I just thought this was always funny. You were talking about the HELOCs and those loans. I, I you know, the, I had a friend of mine say he was refinancing his house and he said, I need to see how expensive the money is going to be. And I went, that's a really weird way to say that. But I guess that's true is how, you know, if you're going to take that loan out of your house, what is that actually going to cost you? Because it's not the, uh, the dollar value of that. I always thought that was really interesting. Sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off either. Yeah, you're completely right, though. Spring, summer is the time to move because what's happening? Uh, it's very nice out weather wise. People don't want to be trekking around in snow or cold weather. And then another thing, Stephen, to your point about being an election year, what happens in September or now I should say August every year? For those of you who have children, school's starting, yeah. right? So a lot of the times, either families that want or need to move want to be into their new house with their new school ahead of time, or they will wait, uh, wait it out and say, you know, I don't want to move in September or October, right. As school is starting. I just don't want to disrupt my family. So that's even kind of like expanding on that, uh, you know, around a, an election year and everyone having e excuses, I guess, but that is one that's a constant every single year. I like that. You know, I we sort of talked about this a little bit, but one of the things that I, I think that is important, especially for now, is like, what are some of those things that we can get done right now? And I know I, I want to say, Steven, somebody said this is a joke, but I think it's actually a fun thing to do is get all of your holiday social posts knocked out in this month. So yes, Christmas, that's great. If you wanted to do, you know, the Thanksgiving one, 
throw on the Hawaiian shirt and then said, do the do the recording of the video in December of, you know, hey, happy Fourth of July or whatever that's going to be. You can get all of those done early. Those don't have to be recorded at that time. So I do like the idea that you can knock out a lot of those videos because you can schedule those out. You know, if you're going to have a, a schedule or even just on like, let's say your platforms, Instagram or LinkedIn, go ahead and schedule those out so that they're already locked and loaded to go. So that way you have a, you know, 20 percent of your social posts all ready to go and it's not even the new year yet so i i don't know i i loved that idea yeah go ahead and you don't need to do it manually anymore yeah and use ai to give you suggestions ideate 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 using ai you know it's well, um go, go into that explain what you mean by that a little bit so uh, when you talk about using ai Let's say we're talking about these social posts. What, where would you go and what would you type into the AI to get the ideas that you're talking about? I get, uh, and it's not a bad question, but the, the question is always, what do I type into the thing, right? And <clears throat> my answer is always, whatever it is you're thinking, type into it, right? It's like, Google, like I think we touched on this before. It's like go people, like there's professional Googlers right that like oh my god you have the answers to everything i don't know jack shit i just googled it um <laughs> so you know it's it's just about taking whatever your thoughts are um and putting them into ai and letting them do the thinking for you because you know and not to get too deep into it but like these ai models are built similarly to the way our brain functions um so it's putting things together that we would naturally put together ourselves it's about just going in there typing in i need 20 social posts from now till january 5th um include the hawaiian shirt one uh create a background image for me for that video and you know just let her rip uh you're not gonna understand it until you start using it you know it's, it's conversational i think that's one thing that mike and i always stress when we talk about AI is just talk to it, you know, just type as though you're having a conversation. I will do all the time. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm asking. I wanted da da da, or you forgot this. Oh, I'm so sorry. Here you go. You know, the AI is designed, it designed to have a two way. It's not like a search engine where you just punch in a, a, a prompt. Yeah, you prompt it, but it, it really works better if you're doing multiple layers of now change this. Well, I don't like doing this. I'm not comfortable with video or, you know, I want the post to be this and it will keep refining and refining. So yeah, when Mike says ID8, ID8, just keep going until you like what you see. If you don't like what you see, tell it and it'll change it. It's, it's, it's designed that way. Or, and I think I brought this up on a previous episode that we've done. If you don't want to ideate or come up with that, Michael, go to Google and type in, give me 25 problems for X, Y, and Z. You can go and take those 25, copy and paste those into ChatGPT and say, hey, ChatGPT, rewrite these in the 15 unique posts for a social media platform and it will spit it out for you. And then, like I said before, take it to Canva, bulk, bulk update into an asset with different colors and change it. And then one last step further, all of your stuff is connected, schedule them out for the entire freaking year and you're your your um, long-term posts are done. And then all you need to worry about is when you get a new listing or something, you know, you eat at a restaurant, you're doing those real-time posts, but you have this machine in the background posting it out from, for as long as you've scheduled it. So that process, if you get really good, and I'll say this to like Steven's comment about like just having a conversation with it, it's not going to be perfect ever, but you just keep, telling it to do something or refine something and you yourself will get better over time, just like learning any new software, or any new process, period. So as you start to do that, I'll also add, make a playbook around this or a standard operating procedure. So you have it spelled out and then we can do this on our team in less than an hour, less than 30 minutes as you do it more and more. But that's the key to Michael's, you know, idea around like, getting everything done right away, but then taking it a step further and having it literally posting for you every day, every twice a day, every other week, every month, whatever you want to do. There are now AI or automations in Facebook, in Canva, in anything really that can auto post for you now. 
And also God, along think, the lines was, of planning uh, ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Good. good. Um, <laughs> I, um, well, I was uh, I was helping one of my friends yesterday. She she's just started her own real estate brokerage. It's it's blockchain based, but we we needed to come up with 52 weeks of drip campaigns um, uh, to where the recipients would receive um, one email about home buying. And then the next week it'd be about crypto. Like, but all of this was generated in chat GPT. And she's like, well, how did they do this before? And I was like, well, they just, you know, they, they outsourced the content creation, just had them write some evergreen bullshit and they populated it in their CRM um, to where like she has control over the content. She has control over the tone. And, you know, the call to action is essentially a link to her website because she wants to drive traffic to her website. So then she can retarget and do all those things. But again, it's you don't have to start from scratch. You just have to tell it exactly what it is you want it to do and then refine it from there. But like Andrew said, you, you have to read it too. You can't just copy and paste it and be like, oh, right. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, Michael, around your um, your tone. So Stephen and I were working on something together that we're still going to finish, Stephen. But you can go into ChatGPT and say, hey, ChatGPT, what kind of tones can you write in? And I think there's like 54. It's like happy, informative, aggressive, mean, angry. And some of the angry ones are really funny but you can use it to write like yourself and write in your style, not to mention, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but you can do my GPTs now and have it read your website, read your Facebook profile, read you. So I have like an Andrew GPT now that's not on open AI, you know, where it's learning from all four of us, but it's just specific to me. So it's getting more and more concise around my tonality and my, the way I speak and what, I want for like billions, for example, or their real estate team or anything else that I'm doing. Uh, so that is also something that I highly recommend. And I'll also just say, you know, kind of writ large, if agents or anyone running a business, if you're not using AI every single day, you are going to get left behind because of the efficiencies AI affords you to do what we just have been talking about in minutes versus weeks or months. And then what does that allow you to do? Well, like Tom was saying earlier, go do what you do best and meet people in person and, you know, get clients and, and get them to their goals. So you're going to, there's going to be a mass uh, change in mindset around this AI concept. It's not going to go away that I know of, unless the government does something crazy, but that's where you're going to be able to have a few keywords that you type into chat TPT that can replace one, two, three full-time employees for free. It's 20 bucks a month for chat GPT 4.0 or whatever version they're on. Well, so think, think that way, get into AI. If you're not, it's very easy, but just get started. Yeah. Now I think that, now that, no that, that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, as a business owner, I think that, yeah, you can replace some of the, maybe some of the writers and stuff like that. But as a person in the industry, that that's not going to replace you as like a real estate agent. I think that's no, important. It did. But my favorite... I got kicked out. Uh, Chat GPT kicked me out of my own company and took over. So I don't even oh. need my own business anymore. <laughs> No, okay, I'm it's Jarvis from Iron Man. Is that what you're saying? Yes, <laughs> it just took yes. over the whole I was, business. I was joking. Yeah. My favorite part of that whole conversation, by the way, is that Steven's giving the chat GPT attitude while he's typing into I was it. He's like, hey, on that. you yeah. know, it's, it's you got it wrong. It's you can't talk oh, to employees I, like that anymore, but you can't talk have, to the computer that way. I have legit <laughs> challenged chat GPT. I'll tell you this story really quick and then I'll tie it together with, with what we were talking about. But, um, I was going through something and it, I kept asking it for stuff for like real estate agents. I was trying to ideate, like, tell me how a realtor could use chat GPT. Very simple question. And it gave me this whole list of stuff. And this is pre like most recent update. This is like six months ago. So it's like market trends and this and that back then GPT didn't have access to live data. And so I'm like, uh, how are you going to do number seven when you don't have access to live data? How are you going to tell me market trends? Oh, I apologize. Yeah, I can't do that. <clears throat> okay, so you're aware of your own capabilities, correct? Yes. <laughs> so I want you to rewrite the list based on what you can actually do currently. And it spit the list back out again. There was a couple more things in there. I'm like, 
you're not understanding me. I was like, I was, I was actually getting mad. I was like, you keep telling me stuff that you cannot physically do. And it's like, I'm so sorry. It took a couple of back and forth. And then it finally spit out a list that was actually usable. And I could have pieced it together. I could have just deleted it, but I was trying to teach it. So at that time, I think I posted on social, like I'm, I'm doing my part to make chat GPT self-aware. Uh, <laughs> like, do you understand your own capabilities? Yes. Okay. Now tell me what you can actually <laughs> Stay away from self-aware. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Skynet and I are close. Did apologize to Steven and sent him a $15 Starbucks gift card. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so back to what we were talking about with, with planning. So what I would also suggest is, you know, if you're if you're an agent that likes to do events throughout the year. So I'm a big fan of like any any reason to get your clients to, to touch base with you. So people make fun of the apple pie thing. Like, oh, giving away apple pies at your office. Hey, if, if, if it gives, if it gets my client in front of me for 10 bucks all day long, uh, how many pies can I buy at Walmart or Sam's club or Costco, whatever. So let's say you're like, okay, I would love to do six events next year, plan them out. Now you can use AI to help come up with the ideas, help come up with the structure. Like how do I, what do I need to do? What are my steps to put this event on? Help me plan out the marketing of the event. So that way you're not scrambling two weeks before the event going, oh, I gotta get the word out. I've done this three months in advance or whatever. Like I already have a plan in place. Uh, my clients, you know, are gonna hear from me on this day and they're gonna get invited to this, da 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 da, -da. Chat GPT can, you know, do a lot of that for you. Like help me, help me plan this. Like what is my, how many days out should I be sending this? And da 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 da, -da. And, I mean, I think, December is a perfect time to sit down and go, I think in March, I'm going to do X. And I know, you know, this is really a popular festival in my town. So I'd love to do something around this. Maybe I'll host a booth at this thing. Um, you know, put it on your calendar, get it planned now. Uh, we're doing the same thing with our training. I sat down with one of our trainers and I'm like, tell me what you're doing for the whole first quarter. I want it on the calendar, what days you're teaching, what topics you're teaching, and I want it to be cohesive. Like we're focusing on listings or whatever for the first quarter. So I want it in a, in a logical succession, what are we going to do? And so now we have a whole framework for the first quarter laid out. We know what days and all that. It, it's, it took like, like an hour to sit down and just hash it out. You know, sit down with your calendar and plan your year. That way, nothing's going to catch you off guard. You know what's happening and you can properly execute it. <clears throat> playbook <clears throat> event playbook put a playbook Get your playbook going i love that that actually dovetails perfectly into the next topic that we were going to talk about which is so we've talked about what you can do in the downtime you know in the november december area that's six weeks where nothing's happening what do we do first when December, when January 1st happens, everybody wants to have a big year. Everybody wants to have, you know, that let's start our business strong. That way, you know, if we, once you start, you can start to not, not coast, but we want to start strong so that we're not pushing the rock up the hill towards once we get to August. You know what I'm saying? So what are those things that help agents or help people in the industry during the first month of the year? And I think you just touched on that is plan your year out. Get some goals going, get some, get some of those things that you need out of the way. That way you can follow that guide, get your playbook going. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So, um, Andrew, you were talking about the playbook. So if I'm going to write a playbook about what my year 2024 is going to be like, what would that, I mean, not, you don't have to get into too much detail, but at a high level, what does that look like? Yeah, I think there's like different variables here though. We'll go off of like Steven's event playbook though, right? So if you want to host an event a quarter, you would spell it out so you're not reinventing the wheel every single time. And then I could give it to you, Tom, if you've never done it before and you can get us 80% of the way there, right? And then using your own brain power, get us the rest of the 20% of the way there and accomplish that. But so that's for like events specifically. But I'll argue that, in 2024 and you your question was what are you doing the first week of january honestly man you should be seeing the results of what you executed or triggered months ago come to fruition so an example of that direct mail i'm not planning my direct mail in november and december and then mailing it in january you need to have mailed that months or weeks in advance and then what I'm doing in the first week of January is I'm tracking relentlessly from the methods that I just went into great detail 
uh, earlier on in this episode, uh, I'm tracking what is working and I'm iterating and I'm tweaking and I'm getting data in real time. I know we're joking about how like some agents don't want to look at data, don't have the ability to look at data, but that is how you make these decisions and not waste your money, right? So you send out mail in November, December, it hits. It takes time to get delivered. It takes time and repetition for someone to open direct mail. Last studies I've read is six or seven times to actually send you mail, Tom, before you even realize that Andrew has been sending you mail. So I'm seeing the results of all those months prior, years prior, et cetera, in January, but then I'm quickly making decisions. Let's say for really simple purposes, I sent out letter A, letter B. I am collecting that information in January as they start to hit. I'm saying, hey, letter A is producing everything. Letter B is 2% of our direct mail campaign. 98% is from letter A, 2% is from letter B. I'm quickly getting rid of letter B, coming out with letter C, delivering that and seeing what is changing in terms of is letter C going to do letter better than letter A. Constantly split testing, A-B testing, whatever you want to call it. But if letter A is producing... I'm also seeing that in real time because of the, the, the way I'm collecting that information. I'm spending more money on it, right? Or I'm ordering it even further in advance to never take my foot off the pedal for letter A. So that is what I am doing. On top of hosting events, on top of weekly trainings with my team, constantly holding our team members accountable to the goals that they agreed to and helping it by training them. That's another thing that we use our data and analytics for. We also, we have company level analytics, but we also have, you know, Steven's data, Michael's data, Tom's data. So we use our system to pull it up for each individual person on the team to see what they're doing in real time and helping them iterate as well. So that's what I'm doing the first quarter, the first week of the new year. And just to kind of jump on that real quick, <clears throat> Andrew has like data for days, right? So he can factor in these macroeconomic trends that we see that that pop up. So, you know, there's an election coming. When the election happens, right, he's going to be able to take those results and project into the future what works and what's not going to work based off the data that he's gathered. So it's not a shotgun blast approach, right? It's, it's you know, it's reading the data so that you're saving on your spend and you're you know, you're putting it into the buckets that's actually going to produce results. So it's, it's if you're going to get into the analytic, analytics game, like now is the time to do that. Um, we can't just continue flying by the seat of our pants and wishing for things to, to come to fruition. It doesn't work that way. It's based off the data. You, you take the data, you put your money where it tells you to put it, and then you're going to see the, uh, you're going to see what's going to happen in the future. There's too much tech now that allows you to get those answers, Michael. And to kind of just like an overarching comment is if you're trying to figure out what to do in January of 2024 on the 13th of December, it's already too late. You're not dead in the water in 2024, but the good, you know, future forward thinking agents, teams, businesses plan 2020. Like I think Amazon planned 2024 back in 2014, right? If you listen to a lot of these um, interviews that Bezos talks about, they plan a decade in advance. Imagine mm -hmm. that. And they're two, three trillion dollar company. That's not by, you know, accident, right? Why are we treating our individual businesses in real estate any differently? They're real businesses with marketing efforts, team efforts and results, right? So for me personally, I was like, I need to get on board with this, with AI, with tech, with data, or I'm not going to be around for much longer because the ones that are keen to what is happening around them are jumping on board and are getting more efficient and using tech to do so. Yeah. Now, one low tech thing that you can do, uh, I'm a big fan of this and it's a little old school. I don't care. I, the old school can work too. And, and this is something that you can do very quickly. It, this doesn't take a long time. So you can wait until the very beginning of, of January. Or if you don't have any more closings for the year, do it now. This is an old trick. Take every closing statement from every closing that you had this year. Write a nice little letter to every client that closed with you explaining why you're sending this to them because they're going to need it for their taxes. 
you know, they're going to file their taxes. They bought a house in 23. They have to, you know, they may want to deduct some things on, on their taxes. And so they, they probably don't know where that paperwork is at home. Like, I don't know. I, maybe it's in my email. I don't know. Or they don't even know that they need it. So you're saying, take this to your, to your tax accountant. They'll, they'll know what to do with it. Da, 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 and ask for a referral in the letter. But like, you can crank that out in no time, you know, or like I said, if you've, if, Let's say you're done for the year. I don't have any more closings for December. Great. You you know who who needs to be on that mailing list. Just do it. If you've got two or three more closings, get your list most of the way done and then finish them off. You don't have to wait till the very end of the month, but you can get those letters out in like a day in January immediately. Boom. Happy New Year. Here's something from your your realtor. Oh, wow. This seems useful. Thank you so much. It's it's low tech, but again, direct mails. Uh, you know, to <laughs> Andrew seems to you know having be having great success with direct mail. It's a and then you can always follow up with a phone call. Hey, I just want to make sure you got the letter I sent you. So, you know, I want to make sure you had those for your taxes. Yada yada yada. Thank you so much for being a client of mine in twenty three. You know, again, you know anybody that's buying or selling, blah blah blah. Let me give you guys an option too. I think that is great, Stephen. So the people that don't have the tech, yes, do that. For our platform, what I would do is I would upload or scan in all the PDFs. We can direct mail directly out of our platform or email it and attach it as an attachment. So send it to them direct mail with the letter and you can do handwritten style letters or just type letters that'll merge and send it directly out of our billions platform. That's what we could do. It will actually attach a, tr a USPS tracking number to it. So you know when it gets delivered and then you can set a reminder that says two days after the system knows it's been delivered, then call them. So they're getting a call, they're getting it in the mail, and they're getting it in an email from me clicking like four buttons and then just having it done for me, which is a very, you know, if you're closing four or 500 deals a year, it might be harder to do that manually. Of course, like if you don't have the capital or a system like that, obviously do it that way. I 100% agree. And we've done that. I didn't do that, but we've handwritten letters before. But as we've advanced and gotten more efficient and grown, in order to scale, we had to buy back our time that way. So there's different options there. Uh, but what's the end result though, Stephen? Like touching them, right? Getting in front of them, helping them out with something that they might uh, be grateful for. Like, oh, I got the transaction receipt. I'm going to give this to my accountant. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's just, it's a simple thing, you know, like high tech or low tech, it's a touch point and that's the name of the game. Right. Do something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. Okay. I, I like that. And, and, you know, now that we're in this phase and we're starting the new year, we have some of those plans. Let's say we have our, our cookbook in there. There was something that, that was said that was, if you, what, this was a question that got asked to me a couple of days ago. And that is, what do you consider a productive agent? Now there's all these different metrics, right? It's, it's, are you valuable to the brokerage? You know, is there a certain number of transactions? To me, it was always, if an agent is closing enough transactions that they can live, that's to me a productive agent. If you have enough transactions throughout the course of the year, that that's your full-time job. That's what you do. You're a real estate agent. To me, that's what being a productive agent is. So Stephen, you were talking about now is the time for any of those hobbyists out there to give, you want to get serious, if you want to be that productive agent that we've been talking about, now is the time. So can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think the end of the year is a, is a lot of the time where agents will start to reevaluate things. I mean, we're going to see a mass exodus out of this industry. We're already seeing it, you know, different state like, like, for instance, West Virginia renews their licenses in July. Tons of people dropped out of the business in July. They just didn't renew their licenses. Board dues are up coming up right now. A lot of people aren't aren't renewing. That's like a thousand dollar check they have to write in a lot of cases. And they're like, eh, it's not worth it. I sold two houses this year. It's an expensive hobby. Uh, but a lot of agents, they may be on the cusp, like, oh, I did, I almost hit my goal. Like I was talking to one of our agents the other day. She's like, I'm I'm gonna miss my goal by one closing. I'm like, but you know you can do it. She's like, Oh, I absolutely know I can do it because I had the closing and it fell through. She's like, so I know the goal I set for myself is attainable. 
I just, <clears throat> now I know what I need to do next year to make sure that that's going to happen. And, and then, so if people are reevaluating their business. I would say that the first thing you should do is be very honest with yourself and figure out what is missing that you can get trained on. What additional certification do I need? What training do I need to go to my manager or my broker and go, I suck at this. How can I get better? You know, maybe I'm bad at prospecting. Maybe I'm, you know, bad at, at the follow through. I don't know. Figure that out. What is keeping you from hitting that stride? What's, you know, they always say, oh, three years, if you can survive three years in the business, you'll, you'll make it. It's almost universally true. That was, that was my third year in the business was, was my best year to that point. Uh, and it was just like this magical gate opened and all of a sudden I'm a professional, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know what it was exactly, but I think evaluate what you think you need and maybe even ask other people, ask, ask a colleague, ask a mentor or a broker and say, what is it that I'm, that I need to do that's keeping, you know, that I need to do to get, move forward or what is keeping me back? Like what's holding me back? And, and accept that feedback very openly and, and go out and get the training. You know, like I'm bad at make, I don't like making cold calls. I hate prospecting. Okay. What can I do to get trained to be more comfortable with prospecting? Uh, you know, or maybe now's the time to evaluate a team thing. You know, <clears throat> I'm great at the appointments. Like I can go out to a listing and I can nail it. Like I'm amazing in front of the client, but I don't know how to get an appointment. I'm terrible at that. Maybe you need to be a part of a, a bigger group where they're, you know, they're setting you up and then you go out and get the business. So you have to look at real estate almost in, I call them silos. There's different sections of the transaction. There's transaction coordination, there's marketing. There's just because you're a realtor doesn't mean that you have to be the, the master of all things. You don't have to be the jack of all trades. You might just say, I specialize in this. I'm a great transaction coordinator and I make a great living just doing transaction coordination. So good for you. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Find your piece of the of the industry. I always say it's multifaceted. It's a great industry because there's so much you can do. I mean, look at us, the four of us. None of us does the same thing, but we're all in the industry. So, you know, evaluate and and decide if there's if there's if it's worthwhile to stay in it. If it's not, then get out. Stop wasting your money. You know, there's a lot of agents out there that just aren't going to make it. And I mean, that's just the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that. You tried it. It didn't work. It's OK. You know, but the, the fact of the matter is there's like, what, a half a million uh, listings on the market nationwide. And there's like one point six million realtors. <laughs> you know, There's not enough inventory to go around. So it's OK if some people just get out of the business or switch into something adjacent. You know, there's a lot of ancillary stuff you can do, too. You got to love it and you got to be good at it, which that's a perfect place to end, I think. So next next session, I, I we always plan out so many topics, um, uh, you know, and and one of the ones that I we didn't quite get to was goal setting. You know what? We're, our January podcast is going to be about how we can set some of those goals. We'll at least start there. There'll be more stuff in there. But uh, thank you all for being here and and uh, listening to the Renegade Consortium. Any of you that made it to the end, thank you. Uh, and let us know if you have any questions. This will be on LinkedIn and YouTube and all of the other great places. So uh, thank you for being here and we'll see you next time.